they better bring out the Brinks truck. They're paying everybody else. I've got to get something. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble. I've already recorded a podcast for today, but after we recorded, a few hours after recording, a couple of big uh, big transactions, or big-ish transactions occurred in the NBA. So while I hate the term emergency podcast, because let's be serious, it's not an emergency. I'm talking about the NBA. Um, I'm just giving you a, an extra show here. I didn't want to wait until Monday to bring to you the, the news or the analysis of the Isaiah Thomas and the Denver, Brooklyn, and Atlanta trade. Michael Bolton, you get paid overtime. Let's get to it. Too. All right, let's get to it indeed. Talk about a couple of moves that did happen in the NBA. First of all, Wayne Ellington, the Duke, talked about him earlier on today's show. Uh, he went back to Miami on a one-year $6 million deal, just slots basically into the same spot that he was last season. The Heat will be welcoming back Dion Waiters, so that could impact some of those minutes. But Waiters is inferior to Josh Richardson. He's inferior to Tyler Johnson. He's inferior to the iron shoulder, Goran Dragic. He's inferior to... Um, Wayne Ellington. So I, I don't really see how Waiters is going to fit into this rotation. He should be the, the odd man out. I don't know that that necessarily will be the case. But Ellington comes in as an elite three-point option, a three-point percentage league uh, monster, and a three-point streaming option in, in most sort of formats. So the Duke is back in Miami, but a player who did change teams uh, in, the, uh, in the last few hours, or actually just like about a half an hour ago, is Isaiah Thomas. He joins the Denver Nuggets on a one-year veteran minimum deal. Obviously, that's a long way away from the $20 million a year. He was uh, suggesting he was worth a few years back. It was a disastrous season for Thomas. Traded in the offseason to the Cavs, where he was shithouse. Ended up being traded by the Cavs to the Lakers, where he was a little bit better than shithouse, but still not fantastic. And now he goes to the Denver Nuggets. He was the 164th ranked player in fantasy this season in 27 minutes per game. And I'd say that there's a decent chance that he actually plays fewer minutes than that this season. The Nuggets backcourt of Gaz Harris. Nice, Gary! And the Blue Arrow, Jamal Murray. They seem entrenched, but we have got one of the more fickle, one of the more... Uh, what's the word, nonsense coaches in the NBA now in charge. The doctor, Michael Malone, in charge there. And we saw early last season, Jamal Murray missed some shots. He'd play 26 minutes a night and he'd get bloody Emmanuel Moutier to come in. So there is every chance that that Murray's minutes are all over the place. Now, when Denver started really going strong, Jamal was playing 34, 35, 36 minutes per night and the team was looking good. He's clearly their point guard of the future. But Malone has history with Thomas back from their days in Sacramento. So don't be surprised that Jamal Murray's minutes or playing time is more inconsistent this season. Well, minutes and playing time are the same thing. Pr- production and playing time is more inconsistent this season just because Malone has an itchy trigger finger and wants to run some bullshit lineups out there. So that is a concern. I don't think that Thomas is going to be a draftable player in standard leagues. Um, again, I don't think he's playing the 27 minutes per night. He's not as good as Jamal Murray, I, d- I don't believe. I know he's one year removed from MVP votes. The hip injury is a massive concern. He's older, he's, um, he's very small, and those players tend to really regress pretty hard. And we saw that last season with Thomas as he shot 37% from the field and 29% from three, coming off a year where he had a 63% true shooting, which was well above career numbers, and then dropped down to 51. It is a massive, massive fall from Isaiah Thomas. He's still quite good at getting to the rim, uh, four free throw attempts per game. That's down from 8.5 the year before, though. So still nowhere near where it needed to be. He can still be productive, and there will be times when he is a viable fantasy guy, even for 12-team leagues. I just don't think the season's going to start off that way. But look for Jamal Murray, I think, to have um, a little bit more risk in, in terms of his production. The other guy who I think is at significant risk is my man, Farton Will Barton. Barton's numbers last season, nearly all of his minutes came when he wasn't sharing the court with Harris Murray 
and Jokic, and you can throw Millsap in there as well. I didn't really do the analysis on Millsap because he missed so much of the season, but so many of his minutes came when he was running as the backup point guard, maybe alongside one or two of those guys, maybe alongside none of them, and he was able to put up much, much bigger numbers in those times. Huge usage boost, massive assist rate boost, got more rebounds, scored more, hit more threes, all of those sort of things. With Thomas in town now to be the backup point guard, Barton is going to be almost strictly a three. Maybe he plays some backup minutes at the two, but he won't have the ball in his hand as much. It will be Murray. It will be Thomas. It will be Jokic. And in that starting five, Farton Will Barton is the worst player by a considerable margin, in my opinion. So I think his usage is going to drop, and I think that his fantasy numbers are hurt quite a bit here by this Thomas situation because it means they won't be staggering the lineups as much to get Barton in as that backup point guard because they've got a backup point guard now. There's Murray, there's Thomas. There's a clear hierarchy. They also made a trade, which we'll talk about soon, to clear up a roster spot. And I think that brings Monty Morris to be converted from a two-way into a full-time contract to be the third point guard. So they're going to be envisaging Barton as a 2-3 now instead of a 1-2-3. And at the one is where so much of his value came from last season. So I'd expect quite a disappointment after signing a four-year, $54 million contract for Barton in terms of his overall fantasy numbers. Because again, when you really dig into it, so much of his playing time and so much of his production came when he was the one running the show, when he was out there with Devin Harris, when he was out there with Trey Lyles or Mason Plumley, and he's not going to get those opportunities as much this season. Yeah, Thomas might be a guy that you'd look at as a last round guy. I probably wouldn't because I just don't see the upside for him to get back to 30 plus minutes. Maybe his hip is fine. Maybe he recovers that uh, MVP vote caliber type of uh, type type of form. I don't necessarily think that'll be the case, and I think he's more of a deeper league guy. But it is intriguing. Their offense is going to be great. Their defense is going to be a disaster again. But they should be pushing for a spot in the playoffs, and they, they should be favored to get one of those spots now in the playoffs. But because of the tight ass nature of the uh, ownership with this Nuggets team. They've had to make a couple of trades to get rid of players to get themselves under the tax. We already spoke about Baby Neck going to uh, the Philadelphia 76ers. That's Wilson Chandler uh, in, in uh, exchange for nothing. And that really did you know, limit their wing three and four depth. They made another trade today as well, which is going to have an impact. Not that these guys played a lot, but it is taking away some players off their roster. The trade that I am talking about was a three-team deal. And the Nuggets sent away quite a bit in this trade to get off of a cash uh, obligations. They sent out Kenneth Fareed, Darrell Arthur, a 2019 first round pick, protected one through 12, so they will almost guaranteed give that pick away, and a second round pick to the Brooklyn Nets. In exchange, they got Isaiah Whitehead, who they will waive. So they sent out two players, a protected first and a second for nothing to get off tax, to get off paying money. That's exactly what they did. Now, Fareed wasn't an every night part of the rotation. Darrell Arthur wasn't an every night part of the rotation, but it does thin out their stocks. And they had a ton of power forward, so they could afford to do this. Oh, I know all that, but it does give them, you know, a guy that was playing power forward a lot last season was Wilson Chandler, and he's no longer around. So they're going to the season with Mason Plumley and Trey Lyles as their backup bigs with Wancho Hernan Gomez. So still some pretty, you know, some some decent enough players, and Farid and Arthur were going to be behind Lyles and Plumley anyway. They were going to be those third and fourth type power forwards. They also drafted Tyler Lydon last season, who was a disaster. He's looked okay at Summer League, but definitely no, not someone you'd be relying upon for regular season minutes. Of course, with Chandler gone, Torrey Craig and Hernan Gomez are going to be those backups behind Barton at the three. But it does mean that Barton, I think, will spend more time at the three as opposed to point guard. But these deals, trading away these two guys, does open a roster spot. Perhaps they do convert Monty Morris now to a full-time contract to become the third string point guard. I think they should. He has looked excellent at Summer League. And it'll be interesting to see if they do that. But his value, which I've talked about on many, many podcasts, is going to be limited because Isaiah Thomas is around. This team still, uh, Michael Porter, I don't think that he is going to necessarily play this season at all. Malik Beasley is going to need to step up in his third season. His summer league has been pretty good, and he can be the backup too there behind uh, behind Gaz Harris with Thomas backing up Murray. And then you've got uh, Craig and Hernan Gomez backing up at the three. Um, Jared Vanderbilt just signed a contract, a three-year guaranteed deal for the Nuggets. He's coming off an injury. We haven't seen him at summer league, so... There's still some question marks about how much he's going to be in the rotation. I would guess not at all. 
but he's around as a young guy uh, also. So there is still some interesting question marks here. Now, in terms of this trade from the players moving to, well, let's cover the rest of the trade, the Brooklyn Nets. They sent out Isaiah Whitehead to Brooklyn. They also sent out Jeremy Lin to the Atlanta Hawks. And in that trade, Lin, uh, not Lin, Brooklyn and Atlanta exchanged second round picks. So basically, Atlanta is taking on Jeremy Lin for a swap of second round picks. It makes very little sense from the, look, they got Lin for nothing. Really, they got him for nothing. But what's, what's the purpose? They had cap space. No one else has cap space. They should be taking on players. They should be the team taking on Kenneth Fareed so they can get a first-round draft pick, not facilitating it so another team can get a first-round draft pick. A weird confluence of events. Now, maybe they have a Dennis Schroeder deal brewing, and they're looking for Lynn to come in there and be the guy that helps Trey Young, is the backup or the starter over Trey Young. And let's not forget that Jeremy Lynn does play at shooting guard. He played there for Charlotte. He played there for the, for the Rockets, played there for a time with the Lakers as well. He can play at the two. He's a big-bodied guard. Uh, he's tall, be, decent-sized body, good strength. He can play at the two as well. And Kent Bazemore's not all that good. I just don't understand this from the Hawks' perspective. Lynn is a above-average player who can contribute. But where is he going to fit into this rotation with Schroeder and Young and Bazemore and Tyler Dorsey and DeAndre Bembry? And again, Lynn's better than a big handful is. To be honest, Lynn's probably the best point guard on this roster, better than Schroeder, better than Young, uh, better than Bazemore as, as a shooting guard as well. So he just gives them an extra option, but sh they shouldn't be looking at getting good players who are 30 years of age. They should be acquiring assets and taking on, acquiring guys and getting assets in return. And that's not what they did here. Lynn is a free agent after this season, so his deal is expiring. So they can re-enter free agency. I just don't, I don't see, unless there's something else, unless Woj is going to drop something as I'm recording as to something else that the Hawks got in this deal, it doesn't really make too much sense. Lynn's a good player. Lynn is a, is a very solid player at... Uh, at this point, but what is the but what's what's the purpose of it? That's I guess that's the the, the real the real um, point of it. Like what what are they actually what are they actually doing here? Uh, love what the Nets have done in this situation, clearing out more space for D'Angelo Russell, for Spencer Dinwiddie, for Karis Levert, for the Blue Swimmer Alan Crabb. Yeah, Lynn, which is going to come back and potentially complicate that rotation. They get a first round pick in in exchange for it. I just don't understand what's really happening in Atlanta. I would imagine that Schroeder is out and we get Young and Lynn at point guard. As I said, we could have a, a, a four-man backcourt of Lynn, Schroeder, Young, and Bazemore, and it would it would make sense. So we'll, we'll see exactly how that works out. It just seems like a complete misuse of that cap space by the Atlanta Hawks in not getting anything back. And Lynn, I don't think you... Well, he's on a one year, he's like one year left, $12 million. It's not a terrible contract. It's not an asset contract where you go, look, I underpaid this guy. He's excellent. We're going to really push forward. And what's the point? Now, from a fantasy point of view, we still have to wait how things play out here in Atlanta. Does Schroeder move on? Will they be looking at Lynn as the starter? If they are looking at... If they are looking at Lynn as the starting point guard, then he has value. But I think his upside is going to be really limited here in Atlanta with Trey Young breathing down his neck and, of course, Schroeder still around as well. So at this point, it's, it's a complete uh, shit show of a point guard and guard rotation. I think that Bazemore has a legitimate chance to not be anywhere close to a standard league guy, especially if Lynn sticks around or if and Schroeder's still around because his minutes will be taken up by those guys. So I don't I think I think this is great for Bazemore, but it feels like there has to be something else coming for Atlanta. Otherwise this move just doesn't make a ton of sense in general. On Brooklyn's side of things, as I said, it really does solidify the value of D'Angelo Russell, of Spencer Dinwiddie, of Karis Levert, and of Alan Crabb. Uh, opening up uh, that minutes that Lynn potentially could have taken. Now, last season we saw at the end of the year when people were healthy, didn't really saw his minutes and role really reduced as D'Angelo Russell got more playing time. Levert also saw his playing time dip. I like Dinwiddie. He's on a great contract. I could see him being moved out for the Nets to acquire an extra or some future assets as well. At this point, I would still have Russell over Dinwiddie in terms of fantasy value. I think that Levert and Crab are probably guys that you want to keep uh, maybe as a last pick. And Dinwiddie, I think, will get significantly overdrafted. 
as people look at everything that he did during the season when uh, when Lynn and Russell were out and try and extrapolate it out to this piece to this season and I don't necessarily think that's going to be the case especially when you look at how things all played out in those last four or five weeks of the season when D'Angelo was back and Dinwiddie was significantly reduced and his shooting really really dropped off a cliff so that is uh, that is important for us to pay attention to as for Kenneth Fareed, Rondé Hollis Jefferson's their starting power forward. Darrell Arthur won't be in the rotation. So we're going to have Jarrett Allen at center. You're going to have Rondé at the four. And you're going to have Fareed maybe coming in and, and taking some minutes. But don't get fooled. He is. Fareed is one of those guys that is certain fantasy players kryptonite. They always want to buy in. Man, he's an animal. He's the manimal. He grabs rebounds. He does this stuff. He's, he's got hair and it flies around. Yeah, that's great. But he's worse than Jared Allen. He's worse than Rondé. He's worse than Ed Davis that they just signed as well. They also brought in Janan Musa, who's a 3-4 sort of a player. I don't really see what Damari Carroll plays the 3-4 as well. I don't think Farid is going to be really anywhere near a 12, 14, 16, probably even 18 team fantasy league. He will be. He might be the backup four behind, um, behind Rondé. Uh, and he probably will be, but I think he'll be the fourth guy in that big rotation behind Davis, Allen, and Hollis Jefferson. So not someone who's really going to have massive fantasy impact. His upside's limited even in 30 plus minutes, and there's no way he is getting to that much in terms of playing time. So some weird uh, maneuvers from the Atlanta Hawks. Still more to do there. I think there's going to be more happening in terms of trades with the Hawks. Also with the Chicago Bulls, who renounced their... Uh, renounced the uh, cap hold on David Nwaba, so re- re- renouncing the restricted free agent tender on him, so he is now an unrestricted free agent. That opens up some cap space for the Bulls, meaning they're looking to either take on a trade, maybe it's Carmelo Anthony, or maybe they're looking to throw a stupid offer at Jabari Parker. I would say that the stupid offer of Jabari Parker is probably what they're going to do. Now, I think Parker's fine. I think he's a solid player. He's fought back from two ACL injuries. He played fairly well in the playoffs. His defense was fine, but the Bulls to commit $80 million to Zach Levine, and if they throw anything close to that to Jabari Parker coming off two ACLs, is is organizational negligence, in my opinion. We'll see how it works. We'll see what they decide to do with Parker. If they give him four years, $50 million, that might even be too much, because coming off two ACLs, I don't see how you can commit $50 million to someone over four years especially. But we'll see what they do with that extra space. It feels like renouncing David Nwaba is definitely a precursor to some sort of move being made by the Bulls. We don't know what that is at this point. That's my immediate reaction to the Isaiah Thomas to Denver situation, plus the Fareed, Darrell Arthur, Isaiah Whitehead, Jeremy Lin three-way trade between the Hawks, the Nets, and the Nuggets. I'll be back on Monday to recap Las Vegas Summer League action and what happened there. And then get some guests on the show for their breakdown from different points of view on what happened in Vegas and on free agency as well. Don't forget, subscribe to this podcast, Google Play, tune in, Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, leave a five-star rating and smash the subscribe button down on YouTube. Give it a thumbs up and leave a comment as well. Follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at redrock underscore b-ball. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Again, see ya. Isaiah Thomas.